Millions of frontline workers keep our economy running and are provided with the latest technology to do their jobs. But digital adoption, especially by frontline workers, is really hard. This is Frontline Innovators. We explore how to overcome challenges and achieve success when we empower our essential workers. I'm Justin Lake. And I'm Gene Signorini. Together, we speak with experts who are leading the way and driving digital transformation to the front line. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful on a mission to help frontline workers learn and use the technology needed to succeed in their jobs. Welcome to the Frontline Innovators Podcast. I'm your host, Gene Signorini, and as always, I'm excited for today's episode. Today's guest is dedicated to transforming the way enterprises deploy, support, and manage a vast and distributed mobile workforce. She's customer-focused with a strategic view on mobile technology, and she's president at Connect, Inc. I'm pleased to welcome Sherry Christofferson to the program. Sherry, thanks for joining today. Thanks for having me, Eugene. I'm really excited for our conversation. I am as well. So obviously you work very closely um, with companies who have frontline workers. Uh, as we'll get into in a bit, your company and your technology is very much focused on empowering them. But the first thing I'd like to start with is, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the deskless workforce today? Sure, Eugene. Yeah, that's there's a lot of them, right, um, that we're all working on. But I, I think it is a matter of understanding what they're actually going through and then the ability for them to get the support they need to do their tasks, their job more efficiently. And I think that's specifically related to the technology that's put in front of them. They get technology to help them do things faster. At least that's what um, the corporations tend to have as a focus and a goal. But the challenge for both sides, the corporate view or, or the big decision makers and those on the front lines is to make things better. But there's, there's a disconnect there. There's some gaps um, that don't allow them to be able to have a voice and express. And I think that that's a bit of a mismatch um, for both sides. And so I think for them, in, in summary, I think for them to get uh, better support and have a voice and be more of a participant in uh, the technology development improvements would be a really nice thing. Uh, I know that would be a really nice thing. I'll give you some examples of some of their feedback um, as we go along here. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things you said that I, I'd love to kind of dig a little bit deeper on. One is, you know, how we provide technology that helps these workers do their jobs better and more efficiently. And the second thing, and this is kind of what I'd like to dive in a little bit deeper on first is this disconnect, the disconnect between what you know, the enterprise itself or the technology decision makers are trying to do and what the frontline workers themselves perceive. So what do you think are the those biggest disconnects that are occurring when we get technology out into the field? Right. Um, well, first of all, how is it actually performing in the fields? How are the mobile users, the frontline workers, how are they, if we're specifically talking about mobility and the ability to use applications um, to track inventory, to do field service, to deliver all these, you know, myriad uh, paths that they have. And they have little uh, ability to input their opinion. And then there's a wall, the disconnect is sort of the wall between what the visibility tools that IT corporations, IT ops, the people who are there to push technology out, they're writing applications, they're setting up uh, wireless networks, they're putting devices and applications in, in folks' hands, and then, they, and then they're gone. And then it's like, okay, well, how are we paying attention to this? And there's a lot of technology out there to help everybody, but it tends to be, and another one of your guests referred to, Dina Self, I believe, referred to a siloed nature mm -hmm. um, to the observation of how actual technology is working for the person holding it in their hand or having to execute on it. 
and the technology, likewise, the visibility, the monitoring, it's also very siloed. So the disconnect really to answer your question succinctly is that there's, there's a time, there's a space there where the users have something they're trying to use and it's breaking down, uh, interesting enough, often referred to as a disconnect, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they lose the connection to the application or they have a latency and nobody knows that unless they verbally communicate it. So we're in a world of digital transformation, which I think one of the main definitions is, you know, if you think about it, just in layman's terms, it's going from analog to digital. And yet we, we have all this digital technology in a very analog um, means to talk about or give feedback or improve the, the conversation between the people using the technology for a very specific purpose. I like to say a point of impact and the people who are there to support them. And it's nothing personal, right? This is just, it's a lack of understanding, visibility, a disconnect, a communication breakdown. Does that clear? Yeah, up? no, the, and, and I mean, there, you know, it, it's funny. There's a disconnect in a, in a lot of ways, as you said, there's literally you know, technical disconnect where the thing isn't working the way it should. And then there's the disconnect between the communication breakdown, if you will, um, from the, you know, from that front line to whoever is supposed to, to support them with the technology. I, I think that's, I, I think that's a great point. And then the other point you made is that creates frustration, right? And, you know, my feeling is, and from several conversations we had is that it's very often misinterpreted, you know, either, um, you know, front lines, it, it's perceived that they're reluctant to use technology, they push back on using using technology. But in a lot of times that really, the root of that is either something like frustration or anxiety, um, or confusion about how to use things. Um, so pull on that thread a little bit, you know, what is yeah. the, you know, you, you, I, you talk a lot to the actual frontline users, right? I mean, you've been on the shop floors. I know that. So how does that frustration manifest itself? Right. They take the device and they throw it into a bin and say, this thing isn't working. They hide it. They become, you know, I mean, you, you've referenced a lot of very human reactions to something that's supposed to be very technical and organized, right? Um, very simple and straightforward. Um, there's going on taking an extra break until somebody figures out what's wrong. Um, all of that manifests uh, as an impact to their person. Um, and I think you you were talking about, well, what what is it that they're looking for? And I, I reference Again, another great conversation you had um, on this uh, podcast with uh, Eric McKinney. And he said, and I wrote it down, I, I quote, just being listened to, they just want to see that you've walked a mile in their shoes uh, makes a big difference. And I was on a, on a call with a customer was referring to some of the things that we had done together. And he said, when we put that little red button on their screen that they could press, and they knew that that was going to result in someone hearing them, like some feedback. Hey, this was disconnected. I, I, it ha please fix it. Right. I mean, you should see the comment you want to talk about the human frustration side, you know, our, our system allows the users to have a, a little widget where they can report issues and it reports back in, uh, to, a, to an interface that the problem solvers like our team and the customer's teams can go and take action on. And you should see some of the comments. This has been happening for too long. Please fix it. You know, um, I don't understand how you put something out into, into your busiest warehouse and you don't know what's going on. I mean, there are some very specific, <laughs> let's call them recommendations <laughs> to the company. And, you know, it's like a, it's like a bad Yelp review. Yeah. So that, you know, their frustrations are many and varied and their reactions to it. Maybe some, you know, there's a lot of research that will tell you, and we've seen this before we implemented this sort of hot help button, um, which was, they just stop. They just give up. Sometimes they don't even come to work. So there's so many far reaching implications of this disconnect between 
what the users are experiencing with the technology and, you know, what the intention is and, and it, they're all good intentions, of course. Yeah. It's, it's funny. You referenced a couple of our uh, other guests on the podcast and it, it, what you were just talking about brought to mind uh, a comment that another one of our guests, Jen McComas made, uh, she said too often technology is done to the frontline workers instead of with them. Um, which, and that comment has always stuck with me. And I think you've just kind of, you know, painted a picture, right. Of what that means when, when technology is done to your workers and not with them. Um, so I, I love those stories, even though they are, they're kind of mini horror stories in a way, right. They're, they're great stories to hear because we have to hear them. Um, and I imagine this is even more exacerbated. I mean, you made a comment that maybe they won't even show up for work. Right. Or they'll take that extra break. Um, and, and that's even more more of an issue today where we're trying to bring new people on board. Right. We've got a labor shortage in, in many uh, sectors. We're trying to bring new people on board and they may get frustrated day one. So yeah. I, I think this is a very important thing to to uh, to really focus on. Um, the other thing you mentioned uh, at the beginning of this conversation was you know, providing them with the technology and the support to do their jobs most effectively. And I think when you describe the frustration that you've observed in the field, you know, it sounds to me, and I'd love to get your perspective, that users want to embrace technology, right? They want to help have technology help them, but their perception when it goes awry is, you know, can be even more detrimental than even doing the project or, or, trying these transformation initiatives to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've seen it. Uh, the trends of the last five years or, or a little bit longer, actually, probably in the last 10, because, um, you know, we've been around for a while and we've seen from the from day one, right, trying to put out mobile devices on these early networks. And then you fast forward to recently where we're, we're changing fundamental operating systems on the devices where we're going from a AS400 backend that has been running a green screen app for the last 15, 20 years to a web-based application that is, you know, kind of like what you see on your consumer phone. Um, and you have a whole world of like new cool stuff that's coming down the pipe that's all supposed to help. But does it? It does. Sure. There's aspects of it that are better. Um, but I think that some of it, and, and it's not to say like people should slow down their innovation, people should slow down their technology deployment, but I think they could benefit greatly um, from taking the steps, the extra steps of um, understanding really what each of those different pieces are are and how they might impact and how they actually impact and how they can continue to be improved throughout the life cycle of the technology deployment, um, which is where you know, everyone kind of expects things to be a little bumpy when you put something new out into the world, right? But but then what about in the long term? There's there's a sense, and I'm going to kind of move into another topic, I think here that we don't necessarily have to go down this rabbit hole, but there's also decision-making how are you making decisions? I mean, Eugene, you've been in this business for a very long time. What is the scale of investment that a company makes in just rolling out a new app? Yeah, I mean, it can be depending on the size, right? You could be talking about millions of dollars, right, of, of investment in some of these applications. Millions and millions, depending on the scale, right? And and not to mention the upgrades to the wireless, the new devices, the workforce itself. I mean, now we're getting into hundreds of millions of dollars. And as an executive to have to make a decision about technology that's going to have far reaching implications throughout their company, they would love <laughs> to probably have, you know, there's different, I mean, humans are interesting, right? There's some sort of level where we're going, well, I don't, I don't want to know if I don't know, I don't have to address it. Right. Like, uh, yeah, that, my arm hurts, but I really don't want to go to the doctor and find out I need shoulder surgery. You know? But from making millions of dollars of uh, investments decisions, 
you want to know bit by bit, which piece is working, which isn't, how can I isolate and decipher and find root cause fast? And how can I help my teams go faster? Because uh, ultimately, and I hearken back to another comment by Eric McKinney, what's the most important thing for everyone is not necessarily money, it's time. And yeah. if you can cut time, right? I, and I think there's this perhaps misperception that the evolution of, of the technology, which we have at our disposal now, has made things easier. And it certainly has, but it hasn't eliminated the complexity. In some ways, maybe it's increase the complexity of putting forth a digital or, or, or mobile initiative. And it's funny, you, you referenced kind of your consum consumer devices, right? As consumers, we expect everything to just work. And it often does, right? We buy an iPhone and it works out of the box. Um, but we often forget that there is a lot of pieces, you kind of referred to this, right? All of these pieces that are in play, particularly when it comes to mobile technologies and for frontline workers. I'd love you to share a little bit with the audience because I know you're very close to this. All those different elements that go into the ultimate experience for those frontline workers. Yeah, I think there's a misconception a little bit that experience is just what lights up on your screen. Do you like if it's red or green or how, you know? How, should the button be over here, over there? And that's sure, certainly part of the user's experience, but um, that's kind of easy to adjust, I would say. The tough part is getting the wireless, the, the wireless in the building, and then there's the wide area network. There's the network that is the wired piece that the application, you know, on the wired side at the data center. And then there's the data center. And then there's the the application running in the data center. I mean, because we're talking about real-time wireless, right? And yep. in any case, there has to be a transmission of all this data across all these varied networks, which includes lots of hardware, lots of things going on. I mean, if you really think about it, it's a bit amazing that anything actually ever works considering all the little pieces, right? But they do and it's wonderful, um, but it's a lot, right? To your point, there's there's host applications, there's their networks, there's the net local networks, and then there's the hardware and software on the device. And then let's not forget, there's the user's interaction with all that from, like I said, should the button be here? Is it coming up right? Is it coming up quickly? Is it slow? Is it disconnected? You know, um, all of these kinds of things, people think of downtime related to some massive outage by a, by a you know, a major um, carrier or something. But what I think a lot of people don't realize, and this is something that we strive to illuminate and resolve for our cu customers and partners and friends is that there's all these little Peccadillos, you know, there's all these little problems, right? Like, oh, okay, every time I go into that one part of the application, I get bumped. And it's not that big a deal every single second, but then it, it, if you're always working that application could be very irritating and it could, it could slow you down. And if you've got a thousand workers who all are kind of having this little hiccup, you, you got to add up all that time and that's something that companies aren't necessarily doing. They, they don't have the analytics. They don't have, I mean, I talk about user perspective. It's not just about their feelings and frustration. It's about the fact that there's hunks of time on a shift by shift basis that are being just lost. I mean, toss it in the dumpster. You're paying somebody 15, 20 bucks an hour, what have you to go and just sit there and wait or complain or walk across the, another one of your guests was, I can't remember his name was talking about this too. Like they stop, they have to walk across the warehouse or go drive to wherever their manager is and try to report this chunks of undocumented time. And that's what we're actually trying to do at connect is quickly, uh, find those little peccadillos, illuminate them, determine the root cause and give the right teams the information to get it solved. Because otherwise it just, it festers and just, it, it doesn't help. And then when you go to do a digital transformation effort or put out a new application, as you know, very well, all of these little problems come to light. And so like, maybe you're trying to train someone on a new app. Well, great, but it's hard to train somebody when that app won't connect. Yeah. And uh, first of all, you're, I think the first guest, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're the first guest who has used the word peccadillos on the program. So I appreciate that. Um, 
And I, I love that. I love that term. Cause it's like, if all these little things add up, right. And you have all these piece parts of an experience an end user experience. And if it's not done right, it winds up getting in the way rather than helping. And I think that's a, that's a great theme. One we we've heard very often. So you mentioned, you mentioned earlier, the little red button that users can tap to get help. And I know that's part of your solution at Connect. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you're doing at Connect. I'm sure our audience would, would love to learn about the company and, and your products. So tell us a little bit about Connect and, and how you're helping to solve some of these challenges. Well, thanks for that opportunity. I'll try to keep it brief, um, but you've definitely set the context, right? So the problem we're trying to solve is that mobile users, frontline workers, the deskless worker, as you're referring to it here, which is so great because it, it encompasses so many people, um, they want a way to report when they have an issue uh, and they want the IT team to be able to get the data to be able to do that. And so what we do is we, we're we almost like listening in, in a way, within the customer's environment, There there's uh, our software is tracking every single back and forth transaction and we can calculate that right away. So that that infrastructure that you just asked me about, all those little stops and pieces along that the data has to travel, we're calculating the time that each of them is taking to do it. And the minute that user hits that red button, which is just a little screen they can pop up, we send it down. It's not something on the device, but they just go, bam, and they can pull up a customized screen. Maybe it says slow, error message, whatever happened to them. Oh, I had a rebuke. Hey, I was in aisle five. Um, that information gets tied into that constant calculation that we're making so that we can say, yes, this calculation that showed that the wireless, the device, whatever it turned out to be, was the thing that was slow. And yes, the user is complaining about it. The, the deskless worker is saying, this is not helping me, it's hindering me. That all gets packaged up and sent out. Uh, in an interface to the right people. So if it turns out that it is a device side problem or it's an application side problem, that information gets streamlined to the right people so that they can look at it. And, and then there's the context, right? Like you don't just want one person who's kind of annoyed that day or having a bad afternoon starts like hitting that button, you know, as a means to like, I don't know, have some frustration release and um, kind of causing an upset. So the thing that is important is that um, there has to be context. So what we try to do is because every user, every single transaction is coming through and we're doing these automatic calculations, we'll know like, was this a one-off? And does this square? Like they're complaining they had a disconnect, but everything's connecting and transacting. You know, you might start to get a sense that, um, you know, they're either you need more information about that or it's not necessarily accurate. Is it happening to anybody else? So if all the all of the these workers are able to report in via very simple click, if you will, and that information is routed immediately um, to the right team for for action, then you now you have you've broke that disconnect. You've connected the two sides. Um, the people who want to help and the people who need the help and you're giving them the right amount of information. That's what, that's what we do. And we call it mobile systems intelligence. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me, you know, what I think that the two, you know, you talked about the disconnect and it, as the challenge, and this is the challenge you guys are trying to solve, right. Is to create almost that feedback loop between the, the user themselves the support team and IT team that needs to help them. But with that layer of data and diagnostics in there that can help validate the issue, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, because that's probably one of the biggest frustrations that users have is not only is it not working, but when I call the help desk or whatever, they can't help me figure out why, or they don't believe that I've got really a problem, right? They start with the lowest common denominator, which is, you know, it's all of us who've ever had a computer issue and is called into a help desk that says it's plugged into the wall, right? <laughs> so you're starting at ground zero, but it sounds like this is a way, as you said before, to kind of help alleviate some of that frustration for the frontline users and, and arm their support teams with the information that they need to help them. Yeah, we call it in a, in a if I can get super nerdy with you, we call it uh, real-time anomaly detection and root cause analysis. And what we're doing is we're capturing the state of everything 
at the moment of a disconnect, a latency, a blank screen, whatever that happens to, to be, there's a snapshot. Uh, one of my engineers refers to it uh, as a DVR recording. Um, I don't know if DVRs are still always um, in fashion, but anyway, it's the idea that you could ba basically press record, although it's you don't need to press it, but that's partly what the users are doing. They're saying, please pay attention to this part because it's yeah. a big, it's a big data set, right? I mean, you've got, I mean, how many users are you, are you all supporting with with some of your software? I mean, it's thousands, thousands tens of yeah. thousands. Right. How do you sift through? And and I, you know, and I'm just gonna because I know, you know, this is sort of a broad topic we're we're dealing with here, but I got to tell you, one of the other observations I have is that there's a lot of data that's great. There's a lot of a lot of data, and it's not necessarily being plugged into all the right places. It's not you being used to plug the holes, uh, in in a many cases. And so I think that with this data set and the way we're processing it and making it relevant, it goes far beyond just helping this one person who's struggling and frustrated. It goes to the point of looking at all of your, looking at your systems, you know, you, you, um, I think Dina self was talking about how she came in and looked at processes. She looked at how the business was dealing with actually the front line and how they're interacting and, and making changes, you know, there's process changes you could make. There's huge improvements you could make in your, in your support processes by having this visibility and data. And, and so that's, you know, I think what's coming is, is how for us as a company is how we can work with our customers better to put this data in context into their operational KPIs more fluidly and allow that to trickle up, if you will, to the executive team who's saying, why, what am I going to spend $20 million on next quarter? Well, it looks like overwhelmingly you have to solve. Yeah, I was just going to ask, I mean, are there any interesting stories that have come out from some of your customer engagements and the things that they have discovered and, and the, the ways they've gone to kind of resolve some of those issues that maybe they've uncovered with your, your software and the data? Yeah, I mean, there's um, a lot of incidental problems that come up. Maybe there's a AP not configured right in Baltimore or Boston or something, yep. right? Um, but then there's like, systemic ongoing issues that need to be addressed from, for example, an, an application side. Um, you would probably talk about this in the sense of making some improvements and tweaks, but when there's detrimental problems, you know, you really need to get down to it. And, and so what we see a lot, and I could call out specific examples, but I think it's actually turning out to be pretty common where we come in and we find something systemic and to be able to address it sometimes isn't easy. Uh, it could, it could require an application rewrite or a tweak to the application. Um, but knowing that that's what they can do and put a price tag on that. If we fix this, this will have X. Yeah. Like if you think about it, Oh, Hey, 50% of your transactions are between your transactions, you know, the, the, the amount of times the, the, the frontline worker is saying enter key, you know, send that information back. And half of those are delayed by two to five seconds. You have an amount there uh, and you know, the reason it's because this particular problem is going on, on the application side, you know what to do. It's same thing from the device side too. We see that a lot as well. There actually, we see that not as much, but to make a small tweak, I mean, let's look at the other side of this you have a problem users are complaining about a lot. And then you have the visibility to say, oh, and this happens quite frequently. All we had to do was, you know, make this configuration change in the browser. Oh, okay. Or update the browser. Okay. Cheap, easy, done, not a big deal. And that can also be an outcome. So uh, I hope that helps answers your it question. It absolutely does. And I think, I, I think one of the ways it helps is it, you know, there's this kind of paralysis sometimes that happens, which, you know, wh where do we, like you referenced earlier, where do we make our investments, right? I think, and and having data to support that's very, very important. The other thing is avoid kicking the can down the road, which is, you know, we know, yeah, maybe our application isn't the most optimal. Yeah, we know we've got some issues, but 
you know, it's not a priority right now. You always hear that. It's not a priority right now. We've, we're prioritizing other things. But when you have the data and the information to say, no, 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 it's actually costing you this inefficiency, right? Your workers on the front lines are losing, you know, hours, right? And days in total, right? Because all these small things add up over time. They sure do. And one of the things I'm exploring um, to help us be more effective and a better partner to our customers and our um, partners is to really find ways to help the customer access the data that they need to understand the implications. Like it, it is shocking to find out sometimes, and I think a lot of your other guests would talk about this too. Yeah, I, I, I would like to see how this isn't how this is working. I'd like to see this metric. I'd like to track certain aspects. And, and when you start digging in with um, a lot of large companies, they have some metrics that they set at some point. And that those metrics and that, that visibility and the things that they put in place were, were obviously limited by the bounds of what they could see yes. or what they yeah. could track. Well, now, as you know, and you're bringing a lot of new traceability and interesting information into the marketplace, a lot of my partners are too. I mean, we're, you know, stuff like device, you know, tracking diagnostics, uh, networks, all of, all of the pieces, they're all bringing in so much more data. And the thing that is challenging is to find um, a company that is tracking things that can relate to that. So like labor is the easiest thing, as you know, you, you brought up early, mentioned earlier, labor scarcity and labor costs, and that's so easy for everybody. Right. But how about on, how, how about, how does the delay in the system actually tie to your on-time shipments? Yeah. You know, um, how many hours did you put in that day when your shipments were slow? How did that hours relate to the hours lost by connectivity issues or, or, or maybe something totally different. But the, the fact is, is there's a, a level of tracking that is possible now. And it's not just from my company. I, it's, it's ubiquitous now that can be implemented to help these companies. I, I see us as, you know, we're a critical, but kind of a niche part of it all. Right. I mean, it's, it's, yes, it's big. It's the whole mobile system, but you know, how that impacts the workers is, is, as you know, only one of the ways, you know, that, that they can be improved or, you know, be made happy or do their jobs faster. And I think if you don't have the analytics and the visibility from many different areas, it, you're, you're, you know, there's gaps like yeah. we were talking about. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, tell me about the story of connect. Like, how did you, how did you get into this? How did you identify that this was a big problem that needed to be solved? Uh, yeah, so the Connect history goes back to actually my father, um, who back in the, I think, early 90s was one of these people out there programming away, trying to make sure, how, you know, how do you, how do you have these applications running on an AS400 and push that out to thousands of devices over these early spread spectrum networks or what have you. So all that to say that from the get-go, Connect has always been in it. I mean, in it. And I mean, in the transaction between the users. And when those users, and from day one, we knew if those users are not happy, there's there's a lot that goes down. People fly in from other countries and they get in a war room and there's <laughs> sweat and there's pizza boxes and, you know, that kind of scene. And then fast forward to today, I mean, you know, I got involved in the company because we had this understanding of, of, the, of the industry. We had previously been providing the connectivity piece, but that became really commoditized in a sense, right? You, as soon as you start going to browsers, you don't need like a special client and you don't need all this other stuff. And so what we started realizing that our customers, and, and this was largely what I went after when I, when I came into the company was, what is it that the customers really like us for? And by and large, when you talk to them, they say, well, I don't know, you guys have a real knack with troubleshooting and getting down to the issues. So then we started really focusing on that and looking, why is that? Well, it's because we're part of the transaction. We can, we, and we're in, okay, well, what happens if we take all these calculations and we push them out to an interface for our customer? What happens for all of us if we give that user a way to mark the problem? Problem capture was always the issue. 
what if we, what if we mark that? What if we tied that in with our analytics? What if we, you know, and you start doing these things and pushing them out there. And before you know it, you have this new thing. Um, and so we're quite a different company than we were, but, but not, but fundamentally the technology is actually the kernel of it is based on that original, um, piece that would tie together everything from the back end to the user. Yeah, it's a, it's a great story. And, you know, very often you, you find these stories of, of, you know, being involved in those early, those early times of mobility, <laughs> right. Have taught lessons that are still relevant today. You know, I always say as much as things have changed and as much as technology has evolved, a lot of the problems still persist, right? Um, which is kind of frustrating in, in some ways. Uh, the question I have for you is, what is the, the trigger point for your customers, the light bulb moment for them mm -hmm. that they know they get it? Oh, we need this. We need, we need to solve this problem. What, what is that? When does that happen for your customers? <laughs> that is a great question. Because they don't know, it's difficult, you know, I think this is called frontline innovators, right? That's what the yeah. podcast is called. And the word innovation is sort of interesting. And um, and what's hard about things that are new and different and haven't, people haven't created a box in their mind for it yet, right? There's nothing there that says, oh, I have this problem, I need that. You right. have runny nose, they, I need a tissue. They don't Sorry. perceive the problem, right? They don't realize they have the problem. So they're not looking yeah. for a solution because they don't recognize the problem. Well, and they don't recognize that there's an ability that, yeah, that they they're dealing with something that, that has a definition and it has, I mean, what we would call problem capture, real-time anomaly detection, all this, they might not realize that that ability is there yet. And so they're not tying those two things together, but what really get to answer your question, what really gets people kind of excited to look around for something is, is again, a sheer human frustration, typically from an IT ops person who is, and, and this is a story, oh my gosh, if I had a hundred dollars for every time that I heard this, oh wait, maybe I do. Okay, so this is the, the, the scenario. It was 2 a.m. on a Saturday or 2 a.m. on a Tuesday and all of us got a call from the operations that were saying, this is insane. We're tired of these interruptions, workflow interruptions. And, and there's always this sort of, I referenced the like people all sweating in a war room with pizza boxes. It sort of gets that way um, virtually now. Yeah. But um, I actually had someone tell me it was so funny. It was an engineer for one of our partners. I think it was on the hardware side, the mobile device side. And he said, yeah, those calls, they can go on for a long time. And if you don't have something to contribute or you're not working on something, I actually fell asleep on one of those calls. Like the, to say that these calls go on for like six or eight hours or 10 hours, and then they do it every other day until the problem is solved. But people are just sitting there and they complain. They say, oh, then we're spinning our wheels. And if, if we only had <laughs> a record of the problem that told us where the bottleneck was, then I could get my life back. And, and that's a painful light bulb, but I think there are more I don't know, less painful ways of coming to that realization, but that's a more fun story, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the, the theme of this discussion is quickly becoming frustration, right? You've got frustrated <laughs> ops managers, right? In the middle of the night, you know, trying to get their shift and their team, uh, you know, working efficiently and they're calling in and waking people up on the IT side and ruining their lives for, for, uh, for a day or two uh, to try to figure out what's going on. Um, it, it's great. So what, you know, let's talk a little bit about what the future holds or what you see as the future holds. Cause as I said, you know, you spent a lot of time in these facilities, um, you know, on the floor with frontline workers. And there's a lot of discussion these days about the concept of future of work. Um, you know, particularly in a, in a post pandemic world, you mentioned the, the, I think both of us talked a little bit about the issue of labor scarcity um, and driving efficiency, increasingly trying to drive efficiency. So what does it look like, you know, among, for frontline workers, what does the future of work look like for, for your customers, um, you know, five years, 10 years down the line? Well, obviously everyone talks about automation in different ways. Um, and I think what we know about people in general, they just want things to be facilitated easier. 
And that means communication. We've been talking a lot about um, information and information flow. And I think you've talked a lot about that on your, on this podcast in general and making people's lives easier is just all you could do. So if you want to automate the um, carry, you know, instead of having someone carry something, you, you have a robot, if you want to have, you know, and robotics comes up a lot, people are worried about, well, w- these jobs are being taken by robots. I mean, robots are cool, but if you think about it in a sense, they still have the fundamental thing where they're connecting They're, I mean, they're doing a lot of cool stuff. Don't get me wrong to be able to move a robot by itself. I, I'm, I'm not just. Dis- discounting that, but they still fundamentally have to connect to some applications on the back end, and they still have to respond, except that they don't have a voice, right? And um, I think the humans and the robot, I don't think putting robots out there, and I I can tell you for a fact, because we do monitor those as well, putting robots on the floor doesn't end a human frustration. It may make it a little more efficient in some areas, and that's important. People strive to that, and I, I support it. I think it's awesome, and I think frontline workers also support it and think it's awesome. And so going forward, I think it's really about um, understanding, and understanding comes from communication, communicating better, um, flow of information to the right people at the right time, and cutting out a lot of unnecessary chatter. I mean, look at your email threads, right? Like you get some of these email threads, there's 30, 40 people on it. There's six months of history. You can't even open it on Outlook, right? That's not a go. You know, we have to be more efficient in how we give each other information. And I think that ties into the data analytics, the faster means of communication, accurate communication. And so if everyone, whether you're a knowledge worker uh, sitting at a desk, as they say, or uh, on the frontline worker, deskless worker access, I mean, I guess this is an old song, but access (laughs) to information really, and access to the right information. And let's not get bogged down um, with trying to push things out um, for the sake of pushing out technology. I mean, it could, you could, we could all benefit, I think, from getting the right information and acting on that. Yeah. And I I think you, you kind of, you know, painted this picture of the fact that, you know, we're, we're, you know, even when we go to automation robotics or in in, integrate automation or robotics, first of all, we still have human beings in the mix. Secondly, we're layering in even more technology, right? And when you're laying in technology, it's great because it can help drive efficiency, but you're also raising the, the chance that, you know, you're, you're adding another layer of complexity into the technology you already have, right? Whether it's in a facility. Um, and all of a sudden, when one of those things, when one of the links in the chain breaks, right, the entire chain is broken. Um, and so there's even a greater need for the things that you've talked about and even a greater potential for that frustration to arise, which says, well, this is all great. And, and the technology we've put in place here is great, but it's not working for us. Right. And when it doesn't work, all of a sudden you've, you've, you know, when you have technology in place that doesn't work, now the people on the floor, right? The people, they can't fix it themselves. Right. And they've got to rely on somebody else to help them solve the problem. Um, and so their hands are, are tied in many ways. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, one of the things we like to talk a little bit about as well uh, on on the podcast, because as you've mentioned, it is called Frontline Innovators. And, you know, there's a lot of folks who are trying to, you know, carve their own path of innovation in their in their own organizations. I'd love to talk a little bit about, more about your personal kind of journey um, to this from, you know, how did you you know, you talked about kind of the family connection to this business, but what propelled you to kind of go into it? You know, what kind of drove you and what drives you now is as leading this company? What have you learned from kind of taking this all on? Yeah. Um, Which I know is a, there's a lot of, que- that's, that's a big question, but you know, one, you can pick a couple things out. Yeah. I think um, what I've learned is there's a lot of smart people out there and we, everyone, pretty much that I come across has great intentions and, and wants to do better. And, um, you know, I've, I've, we all want to talk and we all have something to say, and it's hard to sometimes listen and understand. I mean, I, I find this happening now. Maybe I was a little better at it, uh, earlier on when I came into this and I, I, I was, had a fresh perspective 
and, and in a lot of philosophies around the world, there is something to that, right? There's like no mind, right? Child's mind. You come at something with a, with a way to think, I don't know everything. I don't know everything about this person's experience. I don't know any, I don't know everything about this industry, even though we've been doing it for 30 years, we still don't know everything in the sense of what are people responding to now? You mentioned priorities, but it's just like, what, what are people tackling at the moment? How can I be responsive and feed and give them things that they need? And that in my journey in working with this company with connect has been an interesting personal journey because I, I have to listen and feel and take in things that, I, and, and understand what the facts of the matter is, and then try to couple that with what I'm also hearing from the industry and friends and put it together. Say, this is what people, you know, this can benefit everyone. This is going to benefit us because you can't create as, as you know, you you can't create a technology or a business model that's crushing to you, but great to the customer. Cause that's not going to work because you're going to be crushed. And likewise, you can't create a model that is like unsustainable for the customer, whether it's too expensive or too burdensome. So I've enjoyed trying to, um, really just be responsive and understand uh, what's going on and trying to move the ball forward for everyone. Yeah. And it sounds like balancing, you know, what you talked about is balancing the, you know, the creativity on the technology side, but really looking deep at the customer problem, right? What is the ultimate problem you're trying to solve here? And sometimes it's hard to kind of make those two things fit together. Indeed. Yeah. Bringing it all together is the key. And that's, that's where we all can be successful. So I know also from one of our previous conversations that you, one of your hobbies is martial arts, Japanese martial arts, I believe. Um, and I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about just about that. Like, why did you get into that? What do you, does it, does, you know, I often find that hobbies very much help, mm -hmm you know, you and other areas of your life, which you might not even realize at first blush. So talk a little bit about that passion of yours. <laughs> yeah, it does kind of, it does figure in quite a bit. Um, well, you know, <laughs> now what, what do you practice? What is the, what's the, the name of the martial art? Uh, it's called Aikido okay. and it was based off, it came from the, the samurai and then sort of now imagine you don't have a sword. What are you doing? So there's a lot of throws and, and arm locks and things like this. You get thrown to the ground a lot. I was just going to say, I think getting my own butt kicked all the time. <laughs> Picking yourself back up is a good, uh, is, is a good lesson for, for the, for the head of a, of a small company, I suppose. Oh right? man. Don't, don't you know it? Like just, just, yeah. And, and not taking it personally. Right. Like, um, yeah. Okay. You missed that one. You know, you went down to the mat, you got back up, you went at it again. And then just being like, there's a lot of aspect of being responsive to what's happening to you because you know, everyone, I think everyone thinks of like a martial experience as being very much like, you know, something hits something else and one thing breaks. And actually, if you're doing it right, and this is part of the, the, you know, point of Aikido is that you're actually taking it in and responding to it. You're flowing with it. So you get your, your, your visit to the, to the ground or the mat isn't so painful. You learn how to take that in and you learn how to take it in stride. And so I've, yeah, I've definitely ha mentally, um, uh, having internalized that I, I, yeah, I bet that translates quite, quite a bit to, to the business process, to the innovation process. Oh, that didn't work. Okay. Let's try this. You know, and, and, but it, it has helped because we we've really had to listen to our customers. We've had to try some things. And I think overall for everybody, for both sides, um, it, it, it's going to come out good in the end. And as you know, from your journey and in innovation as well, Eugene. Yeah. Well, Sherry, this has been a wonderful conversation. I think we're going to wrap things up now. I think we could probably keep talking for another half an hour, 45 minutes, and I'm sure you and I will talk again at some point in the future. But uh, I really appreciate you sharing your your thoughts and your experiences with um, with our audience today. I'm sure they appreciated it. So Sherry, thanks again for, for taking the time today. Thank you, Eugene. It's been a blast. I uh, really enjoy talking with you as always. Great. And you can uh, reach out, people can reach out to you on LinkedIn, I suppose, if they want to learn more and um, they can find information about connect at mobile systems intelligence.com, correct? 
That's right. Would okay. love to hear from you. Well, please connect with, with Sherry. Um, and I hope you found this conversation as enjoyable as I have. And if so, please share and rate the podcast. Five-star ratings help ensure that it gets promoted to other professionals like you that are innovating on the front lines. And a reminder, this podcast is sponsored by Skillful, the mobile digital adoption platform for deskless and frontline workers. You can visit the Skillful website at skyllful.com. And if you or someone you know is out there innovating on the front lines, we'd love to hear about it. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn to share your story. See you on our next episode. 